here we go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Improving Lunch and Learn. Before we get started, I wanted to inform you about the Q&A feature. It's a question mark up in the upper right-hand corner of the presentation screen. If you click that icon, it'll open up the question and answer feature, which allows you to send the moderator a question. We'll deliver that to the speaker, and he will answer it at the appropriate time. We're excited to present Tim Rayburn, Vice President of Consulting at Improving, who's going to be sharing with us about achieving speed through trust. Tim, floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Max. And looking forward to talking to everybody today about this great topic. Uh, so as a little bit of background, um, as mentioned, I'm a vice president of consulting out of our Dallas enterprise. And I'm very passionate about you know, bringing people up through the organization, uh, apprenticeship, mentorship, sponsorship, and, and all of these forms. And I've been with Improving since 2009, where we've seen, so I've been with us as we've gone from 60 employees to over 1,300 employees at the current time. And that's going to be relevant as we talk about the realities of some of the things that we're going to discuss today. This, this is based in no small part on real experience that we've really had scaling an organization, trying to make sure that we remain flexible enough. Um, and then on top of that, you know, I've, I've been in, in the software development and management uh, for, for many, many years as well. So today we're going to talk about uh, the concept of trust. And there is a, a book that we're very fond of at Improving called uh, The Speed of Trust by Stephen M. R. Covey. And so the, the concept at the heart of the speed of trust is that trust is a concrete buildable thing. It is not abstract. It is not something that uh, can only be developed over years of, of experience with, a, with someone. It is something that you can work on every single day. And so in the, in the suite of trust, they talk about the, uh, this concept. And this concept right here is the, the biggest thing we're going to go through today. Uh, almost everything we're going to talk about today links back at the end of the day to this trust equation. The fact that if trust is high, then speed, speed will be up and cost will be down. But that if trust is down, speed will also be down and cost will be up, okay? So we have a, a inversely, uh, an inverse relationship between trust and cost, okay? And so if you want cost to go down, then you, uh, if you can raise your trust level, you will see that happen and gain speed in the process. So, inside of the speed of trust, they talk about trust and the behaviors around it really coming from these four cores, these four core concepts of trust. And they start at the bottom from your most internal set of beliefs and behaviors, your integrity, how you behave when no one else is looking, okay? Then you have your intent, the mindset that you bring as you begin to do things, okay? This is still not the actual act of doing things, but it is how you approach the act of doing things. And then you have capabilities. What am I capable of doing? How and so now we have truly gotten to the hard skills, the cap the things that you're going to do that are going to uh, make it obvious to others what what you are doing. Capabilities can be witnessed, right? Intent can't be witnessed. It can be inferred but not witnessed. And integrity absolutely can't be witnessed. Integrity is what's going on in your own head. And then finally, at the top, we have the results. And of course, everybody can see the results of, of what we do, okay? And so the first and hard truth that we need to look at as we talk about trust and we talk about achieving speed in our organizations 
is to recognize that we are going to need to have conversations up and down this spectrum to encourage people to get better, to focus on improving in these various areas. It is, uh, but it is very easy in the grand scheme of things to have a conversation uh, with someone about getting better about how they deliver results. And it is very hard to have a conversation with someone and may in fact never bear fruit to talk with someone about how to increase their integrity in a situation. Uh, this is this coachability spectrum that I, that I bring in. And, I, and the reality is, is that at the top of this, this tree of trust that we have here, the results are very coachable. Capabilities are still coachable, but as we get to an intent and integrity, they become harder and harder to coach because they're more and more fundamental to the person that we're uh, talking to. It is not easy to move someone off of these very fundamental beliefs for them. Now, another book that I'd like to bring into this conversation is a great book by Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, of called No Rules Rules. And one of the concepts out of this book that I want to highlight today is it's very, very related to trust, is the concept of leading with context and not control. As we look to achieve speed, one of the things that we can do is trust in particular with information and the context for why we're doing things, okay? So as you can see here in the quotes, it talks about when you give low-level employees access to information that is generally reserved for high-level executives, they get more done on their own, they work faster without, uh, without stopping to ask for information and approval, they make better decisions without needing input from the top. Now, you can hear in this statement the entire concept of the trust equation played out, right? If we were to recast this sentence we, and simply go, when you trust low-level employees with access to information that is generally reserved for high-level executives, right? Then they get more done and they work faster, right? So getting more done and working faster, that is cost going down as they get more done and that is uh, working faster that speed uh, on the rise once you have taken out and extended that trust, okay? But it also speaks to this need for, for the concept of autonomy. And it's something that we're going to talk a lot about today is the concept of autonomy and that how that is, uh, trust is so fundamental to that. We're, we're going to be in a situation where if you give the ability to make decisions, if you give the autonomy to make decisions to people, that is extending them trust. But if you do it without sharing your context, without sharing what you want out of the work they are doing at a broad level, at a vision level, then you are simply setting yourself up for disappointment and, and unexpected results. What we want to do is to empower people and trust them when, while also providing them the context to understand where their work fits in the overall process. The reality is, is everyone wants to go faster. Everyone wants to go faster until you fall, right? The, uh, the we we all know this from the toddler who's racing down, just barely getting their feet underneath them, and they're stumbling towards uh, towards mom and dad, and everything's great, and they want to just go faster and faster and faster until they take the fall, and then everything is shock, and everything is pain, and the world is not right, right? This this concept that. It is when we fall that our natural inclination is to take a step back and go, I was going too fast, okay? 
not to ask the more important question, why did I fall? It is how you respond to failure is the most important thing to determining long-term speed, okay? If you are not uh, being mindful of how you respond to failure, if you react into the pain alone and don't question and evaluate your failures, if you just react to your failures, you are going to have a perfectly human, perfectly normal set of reactions that will be the enemy to, to speed within your organization, okay? And while it, we would all like to believe that our organizations and that our leadership are above acting like a, uh, a toddler in this situation, the reality is, is that the, dif the difference is in whether or not you ask questions. The toddler is not going to ask questions about why this just happened. The toddler just feels. And we need to move beyond just feeling and ask questions about why this failure just occurred to us. So, a normal response in, uh, to failure is to move up this pyramid from self to relationship with one other, one other person, to team and then to organization. And in uh, Covey's book, these are levels of trust, right? I trust myself, one assumes, very highly. I might trust my relationship that comes next. You know, I might trust my relationship with Max, who's the moderator today, right? And have, have a degree of established trust there. On the flip side, how much do I trust my team, you know, the team that I'm currently working with from a software development and architecture uh, perspective? How much do I trust them, right? And then finally, how much do I trust my organization as a whole? Now, there is absolutely beyond that, how, do, how much do I trust the market and the society, et cetera? But we're going to limit the scope here to these four levels. And when we fail, it's our natural inclination to start pulling in more people or to, to uh, and as such, get more people involved. We have this belief that I'm less likely to fail as a group. And that may be true, but every additional person that you bring in, right, uh, requires more coordination and as such more process, right? And the, as you move up, this pyramid, you are often doing so at the cost of the autonomy of the individual person. And so you're moving away from autonomy and increasing the amount of coordination that is necessary. And coordination takes time, right? So we want to, we want to sit here and think a little bit about how, how can we do this? How can we be aware of where the, the failing occurred, okay? So the, it, the examples might be as follows. If, if I'm a leader in an organization and I've asked this, uh, this team to do a deployment of our software and to release it into production, okay? I probably asked someone in particular, so I trusted the team lead and in my relationship with the team lead, would you please get this deployed? And the, uh, the team lead went to his team and said, we need to get this deployment done. Now, when, if the deployment failed, where did that deployment fail? Did it fail at the level of the team didn't have the right things, didn't do the right things? Did it fail at the fact that Trust was extended to one person who didn't understand the full scope of their project. They didn't understand what was expected of them. And as such, we were in a situation where we failed, right? What level did, did this occur, right? Did, you know, did it happen 
from the perspective of the team, did it happen at an organizational level? I asked them to release something that wasn't ready for production and the, and I knew it, and yet I asked anyway, right? There are, there, there are many ways, but the first question we need to ask ourselves is at what level and why did we fail? What, what was the true root cause here, okay? Now, when we hit these failures, natural inclination is to bring in process. And process is not intrinsically a bad thing. Um, there's gonna be a lot, we're gonna to talk today a lot about autonomy and, uh, and the trusting in your teams, your organization to get done what needs to get done, right? And that might sound at the outset to be, I'm completely against process, which is absolutely not true. Processes have to exist. But all processes remove autonomy. They do. They, they go to, this is the way it should be done, right? You do A and then B and then C and then D. If that is, that is our mindset, if that is the officially accepted pattern, it's great, but it does mean that the autonomy of someone in the middle to go, you want to know this is something? This time we can do A and then D, okay? That autonomy has been removed from anyone who doesn't own the process as a whole. We have said consistency is more important than autonomy, right? And less autonomy will result in less speed. Now, Less speed in the map in, in the micro of you know I Tim can't do my job as fast because I have to exactly follow the process doesn't necessarily mean less speed is for the organization as a whole. But but when the process is applied to my work, it is going to remove some of my autonomy to be able to do my work how I see fit and in the way that I feel aligns with the company's goals in exchange for getting consistency. And the value in process then becomes in, we should implement process when a consistency in one area will result in gains in another area that more than make up for that. So we want to uh, share context with our employees so that they can use their autonomy to work towards the company's larger goals, right? We want them to understand this, these larger goals, and to know how their part works inside the, the larger goals, okay? This only works if context is flowing from the top, though. If you know what the effect of what you're doing and how it works. So as leaders in an organization, we should be regularly talking, not just about why we need a particular thing done or that we need a particular thing done, not just that we need a particular thing done, but the true why for the organization as a whole of why we're doing this thing. So we're gonna talk through an example today as we go through this that is uh, near and dear, certainly to my heart. It is it is a very uh, it is very near and dear, and we're going to talk about it from the perspective of it, is it worth removing autonomy in this situation? Okay, so what's worth removing autonomy for? So the example we're going to use today to talk about this is the concept of timesheets. Now, I am a consultant and work for a consulting organization. And as such, I am regularly tracking my time against the active, uh, against individual clients and the activities I'm doing there for, right? And I, I understand that, yes, I do these timesheets so that, you know, we know how much to charge the client, how, you know, how many hours did I spend for on client X instead of client Y this week. And yet, it's a tedious task that is not fun. It, it always is uh, 
founded, its most important time boundaries are right at the end or the start of a week, right? Or the end or the start of a month. And as such, we're uh, there at points when I want to be thinking about something else. I want to be thinking about starting my weekend. I want to be thinking about trying to get back into the tasks that I have for this client this week. I can make up all sorts of excuses as to why this, this challenge of timesheets is so hard to get right. But most of that is telling myself a story because of the fact that the, that story, that very common mindset, is fueled by not actually understanding where timesheets fit in the greater context of the company. And, and so what has happened for, uh, for most organizations about timesheets is that you've reached the point where you no longer have a tie between the true business context of why timesheets are important and the act of doing them for your average employee. So let's, let's talk through what sharing the context of this would look like, right? What if we led with context, not control, on timesheets? What if we made it clear to absolutely everybody that we need to borrow less money from banks, we need to pay less in loan fees, and that that is the reason why we need timesheet stuff, which is a truth, but it's several levels removed, right? Because of the fact that it has to work up the organization. We need timesheets done on a consistent, timely fashion, because only if timesheets are done in a consistent and timely fashion, can we invoice our clients of, uh, for the time that our consultants have already worked, right? If we're, if we're billing a client on a monthly basis and your timesheet is late and, the, and you're one of 10 consultants at this client, but your timesheet not being there when it needs to be there stops all 10 consultants from being paid for. We don't get to invoice that. And if we don't invoice that, it will not become revenue back to us. And if we're not in a timely fashion getting that revenue back, right, now we have a cash on hand problem. We're not getting the money back that we expected. And as such, we're likely to need to be in a situation where even though, yes, we're owed this money, yes, we'll be paid it eventually, the cash that's currently in the bank account isn't going to cover what we need to do to pay our salaries, pay for all of the various other things that we're doing. And as such, we now need to go and to borrow, right? And the fact that timesheets can result in the, uh, your timesheet being late can result in the company needing to borrow and that your timesheet being late could in fact require the company to borrow up to, you know, depending on how large the client you're on is, right? Could actually result in you having to borrow large amounts of money. Suddenly you're like, whoa, what's going on here, right? We have something that's happening at the self level. We're just asking people to take the account, the personal accountability for their timesheet. But the impact is all the way up at the organizational level and having a significant financial impact because of that. And yet, the most common way that organizations go about this is they wind up starting with and leading with the, we need this done, not the, what this is going to mean if we don't get this done, right? Why do we need this done? The why is the most important thing. The why is what empowers the autonomy. It also empowers when it is a very process-driven item, and this is a very process-driven structure. Timesheets have to be done by a particular process. We don't want a lot of autonomy in how people do timesheets. We want it very regular because of the fact that we have to aggregate them all together. So if, if 
Bob does his timesheet one, one way and Mary does her timesheet another way, that's just going to slow everything down. Process is good in how we approach timesheets because of the fact that the consistency enables a greater win at the next level. And this is where process really redeems itself. This is where we want process to come in. We want process in our organizations when the cost of the lack of autonomy is exceeded by the gains in the consistency, okay? We want to, to find that balance and we want to monitor that balance because it is possible that as things change over time that the balance of the cost uh, to benefit ratio there will, will swing and if it does, you want to be regularly re-examining it. You want to steal, to steal a phrase from the Agile world. You want to be regularly retrospecting on your activities that you're doing and the processes that you've put in place to ask the question, are they still yielding the benefits that we, need, that we wanted from them? Are, they, is, are we still seeing the wins that we saw from implementing that process? That it, was, it continues to be worth the situation of allowing the process to remove some autonomy in exchange for the gains that we get for it. But you need to be able to ask those questions. Max, is hey, there a question? Yeah. Well, we had a couple of uh, just kind of comments that came in. I think we're really made sense right here. One person like put one in that said number three transparency. And that's kind of what you know you were going into and talking about. And then one right behind it said your intent, right? Talking about that intent from the high level up, coming down and creating that transparency, um, you know, makes that comfort feeling. I just, I thought it was good timing. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And there is the, the leading with context is about the transparency from the top of the organization all the way down to the bottom of the organization, right? That, that transparency becomes key there to, to, to share that, right? To be, be willing to go, here is the why, here, this why, if we lead with why, right, um, it, that will make things so much more, result in much better wins if everyone knows the why we're going after a particular goal or a particular direction or we're making a particular choice, right? And it will, in situations where autonomy has remained high, will allow me to be able to make the appropriate decisions about my time, right? If I am given, if I have current commitments around you know, uh, my work and I have about half of my time spoken for, and then I have someone come up and go, hey, I've got an opportunity for you to go and lead a training course or do things like that. I can then individually make the decision and go, all right, I know the greater why of inside our organization of why my billable time is arranged the way it is. I know the benefits and the financial outcomes of what doing a training course or doing a limited time engagement uh, with a client might, uh, might have. And then I can do that cost benefit analysis all myself without having to get five levels of individual approval up and down the, the organization just to be able to do something that I look at and go, yep, that's a no-brainer. We should totally do that. Let's make it happen, okay? But for that to happen, the leader, leadership has to have, have created the transparency, shared the context with me to be able to allow me to know what we're trying to get out of a given situation and I need to be empowered to be able to make that decision, which is to say I need to be trusted to make these decisions. And not only do I need to be trusted to do it, I need to know that I'm trusted to do this, right? Um, one of the things that we as leaders need to do in our organization is make clear what in what areas you have autonomy uh, as an employee. I know very specifically from conversations with, with my own uh, boss, uh, David O'Hara, the president of our Dallas organization, where the, the edges of, of my capability to work autonomously are. 
There are things that I can I can decide and not have to involve him at all. And then there are things where it's going to have an impact enough that he would appreciate a conversation before I make that make that decision, right? It's it's having conversations, open conversations about where those boundaries are. What are the what are the edges, right? Uh, you know the uh, the in the no rules rules books, they they talk about uh, Netflix's rollout internationally to all sorts of different cu uh, uh, cultures around the world, and how they wanted this to result in great content being produced locally in each of these regions, telling telling the stories that were of interest in that region, right? And they their focus there was you know, go and make us successful in whatever next market you can best do it. And that might be affected by where where they were pitched the best content idea. It might be bit pitched or it might be a result of where Netflix and its employees have the deepest roots from a cultural perspective. There were lots of things that could drive this, but go and make us the most successful content delivery in Japan, in China, in Korea, etc., and get us producing great content in those regions, telling the stories that are relevant to that region, right? And then we'll bring it to the rest of the world. We'll turn the best of the best of that to the rest of the world throughout the thing. But that context was set at the top, and then it rippled down through levels, uh, through the various levels, to increasing levels of autonomy throughout. Right. And there was an example given in the book where they're like, hey, who do I need to talk to? I'm thinking about taking, you know, I, I've been given five million dollars to go do this. I'm thinking about taking three quarters of that and making a big bet on this thing. Who do I need to get to approve that? And their answer was nobody that you've been given up to that five million dollars to go uh, go make us successful and if you think this is the right thing then go do it and that just flabbergasted the employee in question because they were like oh my goodness that's a incredible amount of autonomy that has been given at this level and an incredible amount of trust that has been placed in me to make that correct choice so but we're improving, and this talk would not would not be complete if we didn't take a moment to talk about how technology impacts process. Because we've talked about process and the trade-off there. Let's, we need to talk about how does technology play into this. So technology is great at doing one thing. It speeds up collaboration, right? It speeds up the coordination aspects of things. And so it can make processes much much faster but it is a very bad fit when the uh, when there is a high degree of autonomy required because technology will never use its best judgment it doesn't go oh in this case we can skip this step right the only way it can do that is if someone has already told the the, the the technology, oh, we have this rule and we can bypass this in this case. That's just the process being evolved. That is not judgment, right? Technology today does not, Im does not impose judgment, okay? And as such, technology systems have the least amount of autonomy, right? Now, again, if something is highly process-oriented, like timesheets, then technology systems for them are a great example of where you would want to, to implement them. Because again, consistency is king, we need the data to just flow, technology is a great use in a system like that. Which is why ERPs and time tracking systems are so prevalent throughout organizations that we encounter, right? But, if what you're dealing with is something where autonomy is regularly needed, okay, then technology is a really bad choice. And 
the great example of this would be just the human interactions of managing people, right? Why, you know, why isn't Bob in today, right? If I've got something that's like, well, Bob hasn't punched in, so I've got, you know, let's send him a text as soon as he's five minutes uh, late for when we expected him to arrive. Let's give, let's give him an automated call asking for an updated ETA, you know, as soon as he's 15 minutes late. And if Bob isn't in because of the fact that he's off dealing with the fact that his child had an accident this morning and he's in the emergency room, he does not need that text, he does not need that phone call. And this is a situation where the realities of our lives and dealing with the care and compassion that we want to bring to the human interactions of managing people within our organizations is a very bad choice from a, for a technology perspective. This is a situation where autonomy is king. The ability for the people manager to make the right call at the right moment that is the right fit for the employee and what the situation they're in at the moment. That autonomy trumps and is most important. And as such, we shouldn't try to put this all into some massive technology system. Now, I don't know very many companies who are you are you know, interested in deploying something that's going to send nagging texts asking why you haven't clocked in for your shift yet, okay? But I'm sure that somewhere that has been done, okay? We, again, it is a question of how much autonomy is needed and being aware of this as we talk about this for how technology relates to what we're going to do. Uh, I build very large complicated workflow systems, which is a very nice way of saying that most of my time with improving is spent helping companies uh, understand how to turn processes into technology, okay? So I implement technology for processes that have been put into organizations every day of my job. With that said, I try to advise our clients to think about whether or not this is the right place to apply that technology. Because the we want to make sure that we leave the correct degree of human freedom when human freedom is required by the task at hand. So we're gonna go into a little bit of summary here, go back through some of these things and just re-talk re about them. So, how do we achieve speed? How do we achieve speed through trust? Well, it starts at the top and it starts by leading with context. Are we sharing the context of what a given piece of work, what a given piece of effort that we're asking an employee to do? Do they understand the true why they are going about doing that? Not just that we're asking them to check a box, but do you understand the spirit behind the checkbox? Do you understand how it is going to benefit the organization as a whole? If we lead with that context, that is going to allow us to trust more and to uh, allow for more autonomy within the organization. If we don't do this one thing and yet we say that we're trusting and that we're providing all sorts of autonomy, the random results that we'll get back out of that are because of the fact that employees through with, with absolutely the best of intent and integrity will have looked at things and made a decision they believed was in, in alignment with the context of the organization as a whole and only to discover after they have used their autonomy and used the trust that was placed in them to discover that they were out of alignment because they didn't understand it. So when you have an employee who exercises their autonomy to go and attempt to speed things up, and if it goes wrong, again, when we fall, ask why we failed and be willing to look in the mirror and go, it was because of the fact that I didn't lead with enough context for them to understand why that was a suboptimal choice. We have to start by sharing context. Then 
we need when when failings occur and we have shared contacts, we need to, to truly sit back and ask ourselves, what was the where was the failure in, in amongst our four cores here? Was this a failure of we just didn't get the results that we expected, right? Was it the fact that, you know, uh, Manfred wasn't capable of doing this to the level that we needed? The, the, he lacked the capability to do that work. Is it that his intent was incorrect? He, uh, he approached the problem in the wrong way because he was trying to get uh, not just a, a win for the company, but some sort of personal win or, or some other way, didn't approach it with the correct intent, or in the end, was it an integrity problem, right? Uh, the sort of canonical example, they talk about this uh, in the no rules rules here, is the amount of trust that's placed in uh, expensing, uh, expense reports at Netflix, right? Uh, Basically, they for many, many years had spend Netflix money like it was your own, was the only guidance that was given on the only context that was given for how to spend money and expense it. Okay. And when they went through that and they started looking at how that was going to, how those expenses were being actually used, right? They Spot checked a handful of things that uh, a handful of expense reports to see if there were if, if there were problems, right? But mostly, what they were doing was in, they were in search of examples where they believed there was an integrity problem and someone was just taking advantage of the great amount of trust they were extending in their expense report structure. And when those integrity problems occurred, it was often dealt with uh, very harshly because of the fact that a great amount of trust was extended to begin with. And uh, since it was checked only on occasion, they assumed that it had been, they assumed it has to have been going on for some time at that point. And so it was one of the examples of if you were caught doing something truly egregious and essentially stealing money or making very bad decisions, they usually didn't try to coach you out of this. They usually said, wow, I'm sorry, someone who is making that level of integrity choices just isn't the right fit for Netflix. So that in that example, and in, every, in all of these other situations, when you're in this situation, ask yourself, where did you fail? Where did you fail first from within the organization? Was this a singular person? Was it a relationship between people? Was it a group of people or was it the organization as a whole? What level of failure truly was the lowest level that was at, was at fault here? And then ask yourself, why did they fail? Which of the four cores failed here? And once, it, once you've gotten your arms around these two questions, at what level and in what, what core did we fail? Now you finally have enough information to go, oh, I get it. I'm now capable of making the decision about what my response to this should be. And it is entirely possible that there are, and in fact likely, that there are going to be situations where the proper response is to implement more process. But there are also going to be a large number of situations where the proper response to that stumble, to that failure, is instead going to be to coach someone on the process, uh, on how something should be done. Help someone with more context so that they can approach things with the correct intent next time, et cetera, so that you can, can move things along. But resist the urge to run to, towards things that remove autonomy and instead ask, what is the thing I can do that still allows the most autonomy uh, as we move forward. Resist the urge to make blanket requirements because blanket requirements slow everyone down often for what was one or two people's misunderstanding or failure. And 
you try to wrap yourself in the warm blanket of, well, nobody will ever make that mistake again. And yet that was probably already true if you just talked about that there was a failure and, and what caused that failure. And if you're open and transparent about those struggles with the, with the team or organization as a whole, you're going, people are going to naturally avoid making the same mistake again, right? We, we, the question is not, are they going to make the same mistake? Is are, what, are they going to have the context to avoid the next mistake? So with that, do we have any questions, Max? Yeah, Tim, we actually have uh, one comment um, and then a, and a question, but the comment um, is pretty interesting. It says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care or trust them. And mm -hmm. people don't care how much you know until they trust you. I thought that was pretty yep. interesting. Yep, uh, I, I agree. And the, the, this is having that true, you know, emotional connection, right? Like be, having and building trust, it's why trust changes everything is literally the, the, the big banner graphic on the homepage of improving is we, we very much believe that, that we have to be investing in growing trust within all of the people that are involved in our business, all of our stakeholders. So I, I completely concur there. Awesome. Is there anything else? Yeah, there was kind of a follow on, I think, to it, but it's, um, we want to get better and quicker, but most of the time the team will not provide truthful information because they're scared the information will be used against them. What are some ways for team building to show that we care and we want to help everyone get better and faster? So the best examples of how to do this is to, is to lead with transparency again and not show the team that you're not going to punish them, but show the team how you yourself haven't been punished when you have wandered a field, right? So be transparent and open when you have made your own mistakes and make clear to them what the response from your leadership down to you was. When you're open about the fact that you're human, the fact that errors are made, and the fact that that's not something that's going to result in, in, in the immediate termination or that it's going to be used against you constantly, right? The fact that it's being mod that behavior is being modeled to you, right? Will and that you're willing to open up with them about and be transparent about, about your own failings will build that emotional connection with the team. They'll understand, oh, wow, this person is willing to talk to me about their stumbles. And they're going to see that the organization from even above you is committed to a situation of wanting to build trust and making sure that we're, tr we're growing in that way, not in using uh, fumbles and foibles as weapons against, uh, against one another. And that difference of, of, of using, using your own examples and being open about your own, uh, your own challenges is a very good way to make it clear to even those who have come into your organization from, with battle scars from previous uh, or, uh, employers where they just were badly treated. That is a way for them to see, oh, I get it. This is the, this is the thing. Awesome. Tim, thank you for sharing this topic. It's been amazing. Um, and I want to thank everybody that was on today uh, for attending the Lunch and Learn. Uh, as a reminder, the recording to the session will be available on Improving's website at improving.com forward slash virtual hyphen events. Uh, we at Improving uh, just hope you guys have a great weekend. Tim, thank you again. Of course. Thank you.